Good morning, First Church. Why don't you guys stand up? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we worship. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be here to just worship you, Lord, together. We ask that during this time, God, we would just be able to solely focus on you, Lord. Lord, you are the reason that we're here. And we just honor you and glorify you today. Lord, let your will be done. Let your name be praised, God. We love you. Amen.
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord, it's your prayer. you this morning to First Church Ministries. We're glad that you're here with us to praise the Lord with us. We say this a lot, but this morning is not about you. It's something we need to be reminded of all the time because we tend to make things so much about ourselves all the time. 
And so this morning is a time, and, and this ties in with what we've been talking about with the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews has been telling us over and over and over to focus on Jesus. Focus on him, the author and perfecter of your faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so this morning is an opportunity now to do that, to say, I'm going to focus on Jesus this morning. I'm going to try to set aside all these other things. And I know it's hard. I, I know it is because I'm, you know, just... Five minutes ago, I started thinking about a Christmas present for one of my kids. And I said, God, what am I doing? I'm here to worship you, and I'm thinking about that. It's, it's, this is our chance to try to get past those things and focus. Focus on Jesus. This is what this is all about. This is what making this morning not about us. That's what it's about. Because it's all about honoring and praising God together as a part of the body of Christ as we continue, if you'd like to stand, feel free to stand. If you'd like to remain seated, feel free to remain seated. But we just want you to worship and do that together as part of the body. Draw me closer 
And take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Because your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. So pull me a little closer. Take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart, I want to know your heart, cause your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted, I want to know your heart, I want to know your heart.
Uh, you may be seated. As we were singing, one of the things I was thinking about, we sang about um, how much we needed Christ. Lord, I need you like breath, like water, and draw me closer. And I thought about the Apostle Paul saying that I may know him. You know, when I read that, I think, man, you're the Apostle Paul. If anybody knows Jesus, man, you know Jesus. And his whole point is, no, there's so much more. There's so much more for me to know about Jesus, to know him better and to grow closer to him. And then he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And, you know, when we say that, everybody's like, yeah, power. We like that. And then he said, in the fellowship of his sufferings. And we're all like, what? Not so thrilled with that. Not so thrilled with that. Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know him better. I know what I'll go through, the ups and the downs, the hills and the valleys. But in all of that, I want to know Jesus. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing that Jesus says, and I want you to know me. I want that for you. So we're going to take a short break. You can grab another cup of coffee. And you can grab another donut. You have some of the breakfast that I made for everyone. And... Um, you doubt my word <laughs> with good cause um, and, and speak to people just fellowship for just a few minutes and then we're going to call you right back but as you do that also if this is your first time and you've never done this before in the seat back in front of you is a card we'd love to have you fill that out there's a little, little basket back there you can drop it in and what we do is we just send you a letter saying thanks for coming we send you a gift card for a cup of coffee on us just our, as our way of, of saying thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of this morning with us. If you would do that, we would appreciate it. So short break and we'll call you right back. Let's do that now. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Um, let's see. Oh, I want to mention too, I think it's, I'm really excited about our, uh, this, you know, some of you, maybe you do like an advent calendar or different things like this. This 12 days of Christmas is kind of in a sense, something like that to be reminding us of that this time of year, it's about serving others, not just about getting, which is hard to get away from at this time of year. And, and we don't expect everyone to do everything. What, what we're hoping is we will lay out options, about three a week, and you can, you can go, oh, I can, oh, we can do this, or I can do this. And, and, and you plug yourself into things that just put you into the position of serving others, and uh, what I love to, with a lot of these things like port and all of these things that we'll be involved in, uh, our port ministry to the homeless, is that it puts us in the position of serving others, and it is other people who cannot pay us back, who cannot reciprocate. You know, if you, if you give a gift to a family member or you give a gift to a friend, I mean, suppose, you know, you get a gift from a family member that you, um, you haven't been in touch with for quite a long time. You go, and they give you a Christmas gift. Your first thought is, oh, I didn't give them anything. Next year I will, right? Next year I'll reciprocate. Next year I will make this happen. And, and that's the problem is that, that our, so much of our giving is based on uh, you be, you know, people being able to reciprocate. And you feel like you owe someone. Here's an opportunity for you to serve and to give. And there's no way that, that, that you'll, it'll be reciprocated. No way. And this is the best kind of giving because it, 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 it's, it's giving without getting. And I just, I'm really excited about that. So this 12 days of Christmas thing, I'm very, I'm very excited about. Um, so we're in uh, the book of um, Hebrews. We've been going through. We're at the end of Hebrews 6. You know, all throughout this book, we've been seeing that Jesus is better. That's the whole point of this book. He says Jesus is higher. Jesus is greater. Jesus is better. Jesus gives us a more complete. Jesus, all of these things that Jesus is involved in, and he's telling them to focus on those things. And he just took a, a, little, a little rabbit trail, and he kind of wanted to, to, to talk to them a bit about struggles that they were having, and, and he got in their face, the writer got in their face, and so now he's He's kind of going to slide back on track. He wants to talk about Melchizedek more. So in Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 13. I'm going to read that passage for you, and you can follow along in your Bible or online on your phone or whatever, or just listen. 
as he uh, continues talking to them about what God has done for them and how it affects their lives. Here we go. Verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by something greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take, ho take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So he's going to start talking now. He's going to talk, he's, and, and I love this when he says it, it, uh, it, it's this idea that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. I love that idea of, of the, the anchor for the soul type of thing. Uh, quite a few years ago, maybe five or seven years ago, I forget what it was, my wife and I, we did something special. Uh, I saved up and, and I, I rented a houseboat for us on Smith Mountain Lake. Now, if you ever want to do that, it's really fun. Um, the toilets are iffy. But other than that, it's really fun. Um, and I don't even know why I told you that. Like, you're going to go, oh, thanks for that information, Bob. Any, anyways. Uh, we rented in spring, because it's just so much cheaper in spring, you know, summertime is ridiculous. We rented in spring, and we, we got this houseboat. So I took, I took the boating course from uh, the U.S. Boat Association, and I'm a, I'm a captain. I'm a boat captain now, uh, because I could do a true false quest, 20 questions. So there you go. That shows you what's happening in and out of our harbor right now. Um, and I, we rented this houseboat. And so we go out, and it's a huge lake. If you've ever been there, it's just a huge lake. And, and they, I said, so, I mean, ex what exactly do you do at night when you sleep? And they're were, they were like, you sure you have your boat license? They, they say, you has got an anchor at the front and an anchor at the rear. Anchor your boat, and then you sleep, and it's fine. It'll just sit there. So the first night, it, I noticed it was a little breezy. It was a beautiful day. The next day was supposed to be nice. It was a little breezy. So, you know, I, I kind of nosed up to the edge of this island, and I, and I threw out the anchor, you know, and made sure it gripped, and then, you know, tied it down. And, and so then the wind kind of blew the boat around a little bit. So then I threw out the anchor off the back and, you know, and did that whole thing. And I said, this is great. This is going to be so fun. We'll sleep with the windows open and a breeze and out on the high seas, you know, so, uh, Smith Mountain Lake. And... Uh, <clears throat> So we slept, and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I woke up, and I was looking out the window on the, on the starboard side. Yeah, that's right for most of you. Uh, looking out on the starboard side, and I said, there were trees there. We were, we were looking at trees when I went to sleep. And I looked out on the other side, and there's trees on the wrong side. So I thought maybe I got mixed up. So I walked out of the back of the boat and I hadn't. We were on the other side of the island. We had been kind of drifting around, like dragging these anchors around. And we had gone to a whole different place, which, you know, is a little scary because Smith Mountain Lake, if you know, there's a dam at one part. They don't go there with boats. And I thought, we've been drifting. Oh my goodness. I thought, I thought I'd set those anchors but I hadn't. And I, this to me, it's, it's, he's going to talk to us about anchors. He says it's an anchor for our soul. And so I want to talk about that this morning and talk about how, um, how that fits and how that works with our... Uh, eh, you need to come up and tell me how to run this thing. It's done something that I don't understand. Thanks, Jose. Um, so the first thing I want you to see as Jose comes up and helps me from being, yes, thank you, is that our patience is anchored, and this is key, in God's promises. Our patience is anchored in God's promises. You are a miracle worker. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, let's just, that man. You gotta love him. All right, so here we go. Our anchor is, 
our patience is anchored in God's promises. When we are going through difficult situations, when we're in any situations, but difficult situations especially, and these people are, this is why he's writing to them, our patience is anchored in God's promises. And I'm going to just reread a couple of verses to you to see how that works out. He says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised, right? So God makes a number of promises to Abraham. If you know anything about this, throughout the the book of of Genesis, uh, from, from Genesis 12 on, God is making promises. He's speaking to Abraham. He's telling him things. He says, I I will make a great nation out of you. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. See now how this is working. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. And then he says, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. This is the kind of blessing you're going to be. Abraham. And God says, I I got this land for you. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. You'll be a blessing to the whole earth. And so, and this is at the very beginning. So it says, the Bible says, and I love this. And so Abraham went. God said, I want you to go. Abraham went. He obeyed. He said, I'm trusting here. I'm trusting. But there's a problem because if he's going to have all these descendants, he needs a son and Abraham doesn't have a son. You know the story. Many of you do. And God, so God promises him a son. God says, I'm, you're going to have a kid. You're going to have a boy. You're going to have a son. It's going to continue the line. It's going to be a great nation. And then he waits. And then he waits. And then he waits. And, and we don't wait well, do we? I don't wait well. You know, it's kind of like, God, I just asked you for this. <whistles> kind of get it going. We're not good waiters. We pray for something, and if it doesn't happen quickly, we assume that we've missed the point somehow. Or we assume that God is just saying no. Or we assume that um, something uh, has gone wrong here. And sometimes when it's really huge, getting real, sometimes when it's really huge, we begin to doubt. We begin to not trust God. We can even wonder if there really is a God. Because why am I waiting so long? Why am I waiting so long? And God, uh, Abraham, waited. And he waited. And you know what? He struggled with this just like we would struggle. He struggled with waiting just like we struggle with waiting. After waiting a long time, he wondered, did I get the message wrong? Maybe I can help God along with this plan, you know, kickstart it off. And so in Genesis 16, Sarah tells Abraham, look, God has not given a child to you through me. So it must be another way. So sleep with my servant is kind of a surrogate kind of a thing back in those days. And of course, we all know Abraham rebuked her and said, no, Sarah, I love you dearly. I will not sleep with another woman, even if it's our only chance for a child. We're going to trust God. He made a promise. Let's trust him together. Abraham did not say that. He did not say that. Abraham said what most guys probably would have said in that situation. Uh, okay. And that's what he said. And if you know anything about the life of Abraham, you know he did not win any Husband of the Year awards. Because that's not the only time where he dropped the ball big time. And so Hagar, Sarah's servant, has a, has a son. And when she's pregnant, it, things get tough, and it's, it becomes that she's difficult, and Sarah's difficult, and she runs away. And God tells, because she's thinking, uh, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what she's thinking, but some of it may be, I'm not supposed, this wasn't supposed to happen this way. And God comes to her, and he says, Hagar, and I love this, this passage, he says, Hagar, I have, I've seen you. I've seen you. I see where you are. Go back. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your son. Go back. And Hagar says, and this is, in, in um, Genesis says, you are the God who sees me, she said. I have now seen the one who sees me. What an incredible thought. You know, God says the same thing to us. He knows where each one of us are at. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows those things deep down that you haven't told anyone the ugly things, the dark things that you don't want to talk about. 
You don't want to admit to anyone. And God says, I see it. I see you. And he says, and I still love you. You are not disqualified because of that. I still love you. I still pursue you. And so in all of this, God was still faithful to Abraham and to Sarah. One of my favorite, and I've talked about this, one of my favorite scenes is when God comes back and revisits Abraham, and and it's been quite a while, and there's been no son. He says, you're going to have a son. And Sarah is in the tent right there where they're at, where they're right outside the tent, and she's just getting things ready, like probably fixing something typical Middle Eastern, getting something for them to eat. And she hears this visitor say, you're going to have a son. And she goes, ha, ha like that. And God says, God says, why did you laugh? And she says, I didn't laugh. It was a sneeze. You know, she, she says, I, it's so funny to just see her like a small child, like when you had little children and you just knew they were lying, lying their socks off. And you say, why did you do that? I didn't do that. Why is the chocolate on your face? Uh-oh. Right? And that's what Sarah does. I love that scene because it's so human. It's so us. She reacts, Puh! and he says, why'd you laugh? I didn't laugh. And then they couldn't see it, but God was working. Man, this is so good for us to hear. You may not see it, but God is working, and he's still faithful. And so what happens? Well, this is something important for us to realize. When you don't know the outcome, Waiting becomes worrying. When you're not sure, when you doubt seriously what the outcome is, waiting becomes worrying. He's telling them, I want you to see that. He's saying, look at, look at Jesus. Hold on. God is working, even though it doesn't seem like it. He sees you. He hears your cries. He cries with you. Isn't that an amazing thought? In your struggles when you're crying, God is right there. And God is not going, every cloud has a silver lining. You know, things are going to get better, blah, 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 blah. He's crying because he knows the pain. It's like when Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb, right? Jesus went, they said, your, 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 your best friend, in a sense, has died. And he goes to Lazarus' tomb, and he's on his way there, and he sees people, you know, they're mourning, and they're, and they're weeping, and they're missing him. And, he, and it says Jesus starts crying. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he still feels the pain. He feels for them, because this is, this is what we go through on a, in, a, in a world that is corrupted by sin. There's pain and there's ugliness and there's struggle. And he cries with us. That's an amazing thought. We have a God who knows how to cry. But in this broken world, God still keeps his promises. This world is broken because of our sin and God is still working. And people have to wait sometimes. It's, it's shot through the whole Bible, this waiting idea. Abraham and Sarah had to wait. Joseph He had his vision. He had to wait years. David had to wait years for the fulfillment of a promise. And on and on we see that. And when you don't know the outcome, waiting becomes worrying. One time when I was in grad school, um, uh, I was going full-time to grad school, and I was working on, on, as a painter on, on the side, filling in as many hours as I could. You know, my wife was working, and just to get us through this time. And it was... It was you know, you look back, it was a tough time, but it was so fun. We had so much fun together. But one day, I, I'm, I'm painting, and all of a sudden, about 11, I realized I forgot to bring my lunch. And we're painting outside. It's in South Carolina, and it's in the middle of the summer, and it's hot as the blazes. It's as hot as the place I don't want to go. And, 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 and I forgot my lunch. I realized I'd forgotten my lunch. And so I asked the homeowner, can I use your phone? And they said, yeah, because before cell phones, I hate to say I'm that old. And I called I called my wife. It was a Saturday. I called my wife, and I said, honey, listen, I forgot my lunch. Can you make me a lunch and bring it to me where, where we're painting, you know? And, and now, now, if she said this, if she had said this, if she said, Bob, I'm really busy right now. I got a lot of stuff going on. 
I'm going to try to come if I can, but I might be a few hours, might be three or four hours. I can't promise you that I'm going to be able to make it because I got this stuff that I have to do. Well, then what happens? I would be waiting, but I wouldn't know the outcome. And waiting leads to worrying. I'm going, is she going to make it or not? Because I'm about to, you know, I eat some, drink some paint or whatever. Uh, is she going to make it? Is she going to make it? But that's not what she said. What she said was, she said, okay, I can do that. I'll make you a peanut butter sandwich right now with some chips and an apple, and I'll bring you, you know, bring you something to drink. And I know some of you are thinking right now, peanut butter, you mean peanut butter and jelly, right? And I said, no, I don't mean peanut butter and jelly, folks. I just want you to know that. <laughs> jelly just sweetens and ruins the taste. That's all I want to say, and I'm trying to help you. All right, don't sell it for second best. So what happened? I, she said, I'll be there by noon. I'll be there. I see you smiling. Listen, peanuts, little salt, little sugar. That's what we're going to eat in heaven. That's <laughs> peanut butter. Some of you are going to be so disappointed when you get. Okay. I don't, you know, stop talking. Okay, so. So what happened? I called her at 11. She said, I will be there at 12. So I go back to work. But now, Look at this. When you, when you don't know the outcome, waiting becomes worrying. But when you know the outcome, waiting becomes anticipation. Right? So now what's happening? I'm like, yes. Peanut butter. God's manna is coming to me. It's coming to me. It's going to be great. Then, you know, we're going to stop it. I'm going to, oh, I'm so famished. Right? It becomes anticipation instead of worrying. That's a, that's a cool thing when you think about that. Because what happens is, the idea is, God has promised us what will happen in the end. He says there will be final justice. He says there will be true peace. He says there will be eternal joy. This I promise you. This I promise you. So that we can anticipate it. We can rest in it now. This is part of the rest that he's talking about. Knowing God has promised, I can trust him in his promises. So even, th even though... Things look terrible right now. I know in the long run, God's got me. God's got me. So God has promised this in, in Genesis 22 after Abraham has Isaac. God again promises, and this is the one that he's re referring to here because he promises with an oath two different things. He says, I swear by myself that your descendants will be numerous, that you will have this great land, that your offspring, all, your offspring, by, by your offspring, all nations will be blessed. Now, think about this. If you have to take an oath, like we take an oath sometimes. We take an oath uh, in, in, when the president swears. He says, so help me God. So what is he doing? He's saying, I swear by God's name, not, not me, by God. Or, or what is she doing? Whatever, whichever it may be, you know, in the next few elections. So I don't want to be, you know. I want to include everybody. This is a possibility. But is, the whole point is, that's what an oath is. You're swearing by a higher power, something greater than you. And so what does that mean? When you take an oath, it implies there's going to be a delay here. Because you, if you could do it right now, you wouldn't have to swear. You wouldn't have to take an oath. You wouldn't have to promise. You just do it. What you're saying is there's going to be a delay, and there will be a delay for all the nations in the world to be blessed. And the de delay was fulfilled in John 8, 56. Jesus stood before them and said, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Jesus said to them, I'm the fulfillment of those promises. I, through my death, am going to bless all nations. I'm here for the whole world. I'm the fulfillment of that. And that, you know, drove them crazy. How can you? Abraham is old. He's dead. And he's like, he's alive. He's watching me right now. And he's excited to see the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to him and swore with an oath by himself. So our, our patience is angered in God's promises, are in, is anchored. I said angered. Our endurance is anchored in God's purpose, right? Our endurance, how we will get through this, has a solid anchor, a foundation to stand upon in God's purpose. So let's look at that. 
From that scripture we read, people swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said. Just what we were talking about. And it puts an end to all argument because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath because God wanted to impress upon on Abraham that these promises would come true. He's saying he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. All right? So he's talking to people. He says God swore by himself. Anything else could pass away. God is the only thing that stays the same. And in an oath, you swear by someone who is greater than you. And the, and the idea is, and I know we've, people have gotten away from it, but the idea is, is in the background is that I swear by someone who's greater than me and this person will come and punish me if I don't fulfill my promise because I misused their name in that promise. See, that's what an oath is. I swear by this person and this person now has the ability to punish me if I don't follow through with what I, what I swore. That's what's going on there. So it's a guarantee, and the person you swear by is the guarantor. He's the person who says, yep, I guarantee this will happen. I vouch for this person that they will follow through. And God is saying, I vouch for me, because there's no one else who can vouch for me. There's no one else who's, who's powerful enough. We say, so help me God. God says, so help me me. That's how it works. He says, there's no higher way of me to do this. We can trust in the unchangeable nature of God's purpose. It's hard for us to trust people because people change so much. They say one thing, they do another. It happens all the time. People are constantly changing. They're not always meaning to, to, to let you down sometimes, but it happens. My, my, my wife's not here, so I'm just laying it out. My wife told me to block out six days. Don't do anything in those six days. And then I planned to do something in one of those six days. And she was like, what's the deal? Why, why'd you do that? Is there no other day that could happen? I was like, um, yeah, there was no other day it could happen. It's a hockey game. They don't play. They only play once a year. And I, and I said, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did that. I don't know what I was thinking. I forgot, which is terrible. When your wife specifically asks you, please remember this. And then you go, I forgot. I have a forgiving wife. She forgave me. Whew. Right? But that's what happened. People change. They don't even mean to. They make mistakes. They let you down. But God does not change. He doesn't forget. He doesn't, let, he doesn't forget important dates. It's impossible for him to lie. God will never ghost you. He will never leave you. His purposes are unchanging. He has these purposes for this earth, like to reveal his glory to the world. That's one of his purposes. To seek and save the lost. This is something God is saying, this is important for me and important for you. To bring mercy and justice to the oppressed. In the Old Testament, he says, these are things I value. And he's actively doing this right now. In verse 17, that if you look there, it says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear, to the heirs, to the heirs. That's us. We are the heirs where this salvation has been passed down and God has blessed us. He's adopted us in, but we are now heirs. He says, I want to make this very clear to you. You can trust my promises. You can trust them. You can endure because it's anchored in my purpose. So don't quit. Hold fast. Look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on him. This is what the writer of Hebrews is just laying out for us. We can hold fast, not because we're strong, but because he's strong. We can persevere, not by our power, but by God's power. We can keep going, not because we are unfailing, but because he's unfailing. I mean, just look at Abraham. If you study the life of Abraham, it's one disappointment sometime after another at times. It just seems like Abraham, he just never got it. He stumbled, he doubted, he struggled. But God says, oh, he waited patiently. 
because God still used him and used him for his purposes, God said, my plan is being accomplished through this person who is fallible, who, is, who struggles, who, who makes huge mistakes, who does things he knows he shouldn't do. I still work through him. Isn't that great? We have a God that says, I understand that you make mistakes. I understand you make mistakes. Isn't that a nice way of saying, I understand that you're a sinner and you, make, and you sin? I understand that. I understand that sometimes you're going to hurt people. I understand that sometimes you're going to do things that you wish you had never done, and I can still use you if you'll yield to me. I can still use you. I want you. And, 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 and then as you yield and you grow, you begin, these things begin to become less and less, more in the past, less a part of your life, these things that, that cause problems. So in verse 18, God did this so that, that word, the, the word there that's for so that is a purpose. He says, okay, here's a purpose statement. This is important. Two uncha- un- by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. I want to encourage you in this, he says. I know you're struggling. The two unchangeable things, the promise that he made, it can't be changed. The oath that he swore by, it can't be changed. Neither one of them. And he says that because he says, I know there are people, he says, we who have fled, I know there are people who have endured difficult times. He's writing to people who are enduring incredible struggles. He says, I know that. I know that. And I want to encourage you in this. The sinful sinful world is impacting their lives in an incredibly negative way, and he writes to encourage them. And this happens to us. This sinful world can impact our lives in incredibly negative ways. And he says, this, here's the encouragement for that. Read this, think about this, work through this. God is saying, I made you for something. I made you to declare my glory. I made you to lead others to me. I made you, I have a plan for you. And it is, and, and I, I love in the, where it says set before us, that's, a, that's a, a Hebrew word that has this idea of something being uncovered bit by bit by bit. And, and it was a word they would use for when they unrolled a scroll and more and more of the writing was revealed as they unrolled the scroll. Think of it as a vacation brochure. You get a vacation brochure and you go, oh, this looks good. You flip it in, oh, oh, oh. and you go, oh, look at that, you know, indoor pool. Oh, you know, I'm going to have a hot tub in my room, you know, and you, it unfolds before you and you're going, this is getting better and better. And he's saying, this is what I'm doing here. I am unrolling this like a scroll. Not so that your life is a vacation, but he says, I want your life to be an adventure. You know, sometimes an adventure can be difficult to go through. But what it does is it brings about something good. And he says, I have that for you. And Paul writes about this in the New Testament. He writes about this in Ephesians chapter 2. Think about how this correlates. Let me just read this to you. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. See, he's starting to say, look, look, look. What motivates God in this? His love. That is the motivation, his love for you. God raised us up with Christ. Now he's showing what he did with us. He raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that purpose, in order that in the coming ages he might show the un- incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by work. So no one can boast. He's saying, look, this is why I did this. I did this because I love you. This is my over, this is, you know, just so powerful for me. And I did this, so now you will go. The incomparable riches of his grace will be shown. How? Through us. Through us. Every one of us here, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Christ as your savior, Right? You have a unique background. You have unique things that have happened in your life. Some good, some bad, some really cool, some really horrible. And God says, you are going to go. And you are going to affect other people. You are going to impact other people. And you are a miracle. 
because of all this stuff that has happened to you before. Now look what I'm going to do through you. I'm going to redeem it all, even the worst things, and I'm going to make it happen for good. You're a miracle. He says, now go out. Go out. Show the incomparable riches of my grace. And then the last verse of that chapter says, for we, and this is the miracle, we are God's handiwork. You know, I love this part. I talk about it all the time, so you're sick of me saying it. Handiwork, the word is poema. It's the word we get poem, but the word meant back then masterpiece. You're God's masterpiece. Now, I know you may not look up here and say, Bob, you don't look like a masterpiece to me. I know, but he's not done. He's not done. You're God's masterpiece. He is chipping away at you like a master. You know, he's just chipping away on this piece of marble to create David, to create this beautiful statue, to create something, a masterpiece out of you. So we're God's masterpiece. Why is he making this masterpiece? What is his purpose? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The good works are how we show his incomparable grace, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God saw you coming billions of years ago. And he said, I got some things I want Bob to do. I'm preparing those in advance. I got things that he, he wants you to do. He's preparing them in advance. And you know what? I want to tell you, because sometimes we get, this, we get mixed up on this, so we think, what, am I going to get up in, in a stadium and preach to 10,000 people and watch them all come forward for Christ? No. It's because we think those, those things are the big things. They're not the big things. Those aren't the big things. Here's what the big things are sliding a plate of hot food to a homeless guy who has nothing to eat, a homeless woman with her children who have nothing to eat. And by the grace of Jesus Christ, giving them food for the night, a place to stay, God goes, that's huge. Why? Because when you do this for the least of these, you do it for me. That's why we're having the 12 days of Christmas, to do those kind of things so that we can impact people in huge ways. And in our culture, we think of huge as big things, big explosions. In God's plans, it, it's tiny things sometimes. Just the right words in the right situation. All right? I mean, I just think... Shoot. Um, five or six years ago, someone from this church said to Manny, you should check out First Church Ministries. I think you'd like it. And he came. And he came to know Jesus Christ. And leukemia finally took his life a month ago. But not after he'd done some huge things. Little things to us, but huge things for God. And it started with a little thing. A, just a, a mention. Just a mention. Hey, come check out my church. And it led, I mean, Manny Mansford right now is looking into the face of Jesus. He is with him. And it's because one person faithfully said, why don't you check out my church? It can be something so small, so off the cuff, and yet what happens? Eternity has been changed because of that. You can do that. You may not be able to preach in front of 10,000 people at a stadium, like, like a second coming of Billy Graham or something. You may not be able to do that. But you can say to somebody, man, well, I can tell you Jesus has changed my life. I can tell you where I, I meet with people and talk about Jesus. I can tell you. can do that. And that changed Manny's life for eternity. And Manny reached out to others, and others have changed for eternity. This is incredible. We're dealing with a power here that we totally totally misunderstand. We totally underestimate. We're dealing with the power to change a person's life for eternity. Not just be a good influence, but change their life for eternity. Never think that is small. Never think those kind of opportunities are small. Okay, I'm crying and I can't even read the words. Um, okay. Our patience is, anger, is anchored in God's promises. Our endurance is anchored in God's purpose. Our hope is anchored in God's presence. We have this hope, this, this trust 
on these promises on this oath. That's what he's talking about. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. Doesn't blow around to the other side of the island when the wind is blowing. It enters the inner sanctuary. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, we talked a lot about Melchizedek, and we're going to talk a lot more about it, so I can't spend too much time that, but what is he talking about? He's talking about the Jewish temple. When you walk to the Jewish temple, there's a giant courtyard. Tens of thousands of people could meet in that giant courtyard. And then you meet a wall, the balustres, uh, I think it's called, and that wall is where Gentiles have to stop and only Jews can go in. And it has a warning on it. We still have one of the signs that was on it from Jesus' day. If you enter in here, your, soul, your, your life is your fault. In other words, we're going to kill you if you go past this. And then you come in, and they go in, in, in through. Uh, why am I telling you this when I've got it right here? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so you see on, on that picture, this is, the whole thing is the temple is gigantic. And then there's that short, low wall that goes around it. And then they go into towards the front. Those are the, the four courts. And then when they go, you see the, the bigger building in the back. That's, that's the holy place. It has two gigantic doors that, um, that lead into that place. I, I wrote down the, the hakel, they're called. These, why, what does that matter? Two gigantic doors. And when those doors open, you go into the holy place. And, and there's the candelabra, and there's the bread, and there's all these things. And then there's a curtain towards the back. And behind that curtain is the Holy of Holies where God dwells, where, where, where the Lord is. And no one goes in there because that curtain keeps people from going in and it's, it, it's a sign of their sins. You go in as a sinful person, God will strike you dead. That's what, you know, and so that curtain is to remind them your sins keep you from the presence of God. That's what's going on there. And then it's blocking, in a sense, your intimacy with God. And then one time a year, the high priest would take a sin offering to God. He would, a high priest would, he would sacrifice a lamb and he'd go in to the Holy of Holies. He'd go past the curtain. He had to go through all this cleansing stuff, all this stuff to make sure he is clean. And he would go in there and he would offer for the sins. And then he would come out and we've talked about this. They'd take this goat and he would lay the sins, you know, kind of metaphorically, the sins of the whole nation on this goat. And then, boop, they'd kick the goat out and off their sins would go. And they would go, oh. And I mean, this, this is literal. The sins of the whole nation are gone. But God would tell them, this is temporary. They're not gone. They're just covered for a while. It's only temporary. And, and in the book of Isaiah, he talks about this lamb of God who will be the final offering for sin and take them the sins away. And I'd, I'd love to, we don't have time. It's a beautiful passage um, if you think about it, um, I didn't even write it down. I'll just, it, this beautiful passage where he just talks about this lamb who remains silent as he's going to be killed. This lamb who doesn't resist, who goes willingly. This lamb that all our iniquities are poured upon. And this lamb takes them away forever, forever. And in the book of John, early on, uh, the prophet sees Jesus. And he goes, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is that Lamb. He, he says, I'm that Lamb. He's, he's the Lamb. But the interesting thing is, and we studied this before, he's the Lamb and he's the high priest. He's the high priest that goes in to make the offering. And he's the high priest. He's the Lamb who is offered. And he's a high priest from the line of Melchizedek, that special line. And he entered on our behalf and he became the offering and the book of Hebrews keeps bringing us back to this. We are confronted with our sins, and then we are comforted by the grace of God. And Jesus says, I have died to take your sins away permanently, so that now we have redemption, we have freedom, we have peace, we have reconciliation, we have victory. And this veil, this giant veil, this, it's, it's, it's incredible, it's like 30, 40 feet high, this veil, when Jesus died, Scripture tells us it ripped from the top to the bottom to show that God ripped it, not man. And it ripped from the top to the bottom. Why? To tell us, you can come into my presence now. Through Jesus, you can enter into the Holy of Holies. We are now in the presence of God. And it's a little rabbit trail. Here we go. Okay, see the big building? 
Okay, there's, up there, there's two giant doors. They, they have gold on them, and the hakel, they're called, and they, and, and they would swing open when they would go in to offer at the Holy of Holies. And, and when the, uh, I'll just give it to you quickly. Um, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, two, two great writings of Israel that were written different places and in different times. They both bring this up. Jo, uh, Josephus mentions it. Tacitus kind of alludes to it, uh, the Roman scholar. But what the Talmud say is that about 40 years before the destruction, destruction of Jerusalem, the Hakel started opening at night on their own. The doors would just swing open. In fact, they even said one rabbi went and, and, and rebuked the doors themselves. You're not doing your job. Shame on you. you know, I'm gonna, we'll, do, we'll build new doors. We're gonna be. And, and so he got mad at them that, that these doors that were not supposed, they're so heavy they, weren't, they just weren't made to swing open on their own, and they just started opening on their own. About 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Destruction of Jerusalem was A.D. 70, and about 40 years before A.D. 70 was when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and the Holy of Holies, the holy place, was opened up to us. And I think this is one of those times where God just said, I'm going to give you a little visual example of what I have done with Jesus. I have torn that veil, and the doors are open. Come into the holy place. No obstruction. Come. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. There's no doors. There's no hoops you got to jump through. There's no veil blocking the way. Just come. Just come. My yoke is easy. I will give you rest. Come to me. So we have these promises. We have this purpose. We have, we're in the presence of God. We have an anchor that holds in the stormy times. And that that anchor became something that was, was uh, grabbed by uh, the early Christians. And they started, oftentimes they would put an anchor on a tomb. We know in the catacombs below Rome where sometimes, you know, it was, it was not good to let anybody know you were a Christian. Many of the Christians that died would have an anchor. We have, we have tons of them. But here's one. Uh, this is from the catacombs in... Uh, I forget which one exactly it was. I, I, I don't remember the person's his whole area. Huge network of tombs. And here you see they have, they have the anchor, and then the other thing that really took hold in that day was the fish, and it was placed upon the tomb of a person. I was just saying, this person's a Christian, and they have an anchor that holds. And what, is, what would the, the fish mean? It meant ichthus. It was a, a, a series of letters that made them think of Christ. We have an anchor that holds, and what is that anchor securely on? Jesus Christ. That's what that person said. And oftentimes they'd use that anchor at a place where they were going to have a meeting. They'd say, meet at the anchor. Or a person would put that sometimes on their door to let other Christians know, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And this anchor became a symbol of their future hope, that it, that it is solid, that it is anchored. It may be hard now, but it will not always be because God's anchor holds. And our safety and our security is ultimately in him. So let me encourage you as we leave, take time to maybe think about, maybe look up even, the promises of God, the things God has promised us as followers of Jesus Christ. Because that's what helps us to be patient and to endure in the difficult times. And are you in a waiting time right now? There's something big going on. You're just, you're just waiting. Rest in these promises. If you cry, he cries with you. If you, if you have joy, he has joy with you. And then think about what God may want you to be doing in these times. The times where you're at right now. Remember earlier, he said, today is the day. Today is the day. It's a good day. What might his purpose be for you right now? Is there a family member that you could speak to? A friend, a person at work, someone who needs you? Remember, God used Abraham even when he was waiting for the, the promise of his son. God didn't just say, put him on hold and say, just wait patiently over here on the, on the front porch in a rocking chair. Go. You know, he didn't say that. He said, I want you to continue. I got other people I want you to touch. Other hearts I want you to touch. And then think about it, what it means now to be able to go to God at any time to Begin to talk to God, and you are face-to-face -face with him. Face-to-face -face with him. 
Not God up in heaven going, say, say that again. You know, no. It's God saying, what is it? What is it, Bob? I'm right here. I'm face to face with you. Tell me what it is. I think, you know, Hebrews does such a good job of confronting us with our sins and then immediately comforting us with the grace of God. And so it can change our life when we begin to realize now through our high priest, Jesus Christ, from the order of Melchizedek, we have entrance into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God, the very face of God, anytime. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. God, this is, this is what we need. Even when we struggle, we know we need this. We need you. We see so many things that we think are good and will help us, and so many times they fail us, they let us down. They never quite measure up to what they would, we'd hoped they would be. But you never fail. You never forsake. You never leave. Lord, help us to rest in that and find strength in that as we go through times that are difficult. And Lord, help us to remember and hold on to it as we go through the great times. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory because you are a good God. And from the beginning, you have loved us and anticipated us as we come to this earth. Lord, help us to follow closely after our rabbi Jesus and emulate him in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you one last thing, and that is this. Um, in the back, there's a basket, and there's three-by-five cards there and pens. And if you have something, especially, you know, sometimes Christmas season can be a most difficult time for some people. If you have something you would like us to pray for, you just write it on that card and drop it in there. You don't have to put your name on it. It will go to a group of people who have promised that they will be praying for these things faithfully. And they will pray for you and, or for a friend or whatever it is. You can sign it. You don't have to sign it. But we'd love for you to, to, take, uh, to take use of that and allow us to pray for you. Uh, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. It's a good time for us to remember what it is to be thankful. God bless you, and you are dismissed.